Good evening, and welcome to the Howard Studio Theater for our first community conversation of 2015. I'd like to thank our forum partner, the Bradenton Herald, and our broadcast partner, METV, and a special thank you to our panelists for joining us this evening for this important conversation. College campuses have traditionally been a place where healthy, lively discussions can take place about very current and relevant topics, and tonight is an example of that. We're very proud to be able to bring that to this community. I think we have an interesting and important topic for you tonight. Our biggest challenges are typically our greatest opportunities. Today, you can access the internet from almost anywhere on any number of devices. We conduct most aspects of our professional, financial, and even educational lives through the internet. This gives us unlimited access to news and information at any time we want it. It also creates an unprecedented vulnerability that a new class of criminal is eager to ex exploit, the cyber criminal. You only need to look at the headlines to see how widespread cyber crime is. Data breaches, gas pump skimmers, tax return fraud, but many of you have already experienced this personally. And if you haven't, it's likely that you will in the near future. In the midst of this challenge, the State College of Florida, we see an opportunity for our community. Cybersecurity is one of the fastest growing industries in the United States and in our region, with high demand, high paying jobs. In the fall of 2015, SCF adds a specialization in cybersecurity to our Network Systems Technology Associate of Science degree. This two-year program will allow our graduates to fill a need in our community, and it's always our goal to be responsive to the needs in our community, as well as to provide opportunities for our students to gain employment in high-value, high-wage industries. Now I'd like to thank um, our fellow Community Conversation moderator, Chris Willey, and turn it over to you to take us from here. Thank you, Dr. Proswell. appreciate that. Thanks to all, again, for attending tonight's community conversation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, unlike past uh, Herald uh, SCF forums, we will take questions from the uh, panel, uh, from the uh, crowd here. Let me introduce our panel, who, uh, all, both of whom are very well versed on the issue of internet security and protecting your personal information. Our guests tonight are two experts in the growing field of web protection, both with State College of Florida, Manatee, Sarasota. And they are Mark Baker, Information Security Administrator, and William Culver, Assistant Professor of Business and Technology. Now, I'd like to give you a little bit of in background information on them so you appreciate their expertise in both of these fields. Uh, William Culver has 30 years of business and information technology experience in the public, private, and government sectors. Uh, and he is the uh, SCF Networking Information Security and Business Program Leader. He holds a Bachelor in Science in Accounting and Computer Science from State University of New York at Albany and a an, Master's in Information Technology from Capella University. He holds a number of professional certifications that absolutely back up his expertise and knowledge in this field. Mark Baker is the Information Technology Security Administrator for State College of Florida, and his duties at the college include conducting IT security and risk assessments, vulnerability testing, security program design, policy development, and security awareness training. These are all vital fields in today's world. He also serves as an online classroom moderator and mentor for a uh, SANS Technology Institute and has more than 10 years of IT experience. And prior to coming to SCF, he owned a company that focused on IT and audio video projects contracting for organizations such as Target, which recently got hacked, the US Air Force, Weston Resorts, and Morgan Security. He too carries a number of professional certifications. So let's, uh, let's get right to the questions. If I can find one. All right, let's start with uh, Mark. Two questions. Uh, the general public is most focused on um, 
the theft of personal information, passwords, financial information, tax records, health records, and other information. The internet is an inherently insecure channel for exchanging information, which leads to a high risk of intrusion or fraud, including phishing. According to a January 2013 fraud report, the global losses from phishing alone were estimated at 1.5 billion. That's how vulnerable we are. Uh, so two questions on that, Mark. What are the common mistakes that people make to expose their internet vulnerability and what are the best practices to thwart hackers and thieves? Um, in looking at that, one thing is unethical hackers are always looking for open doors and probably the number one thing that I see is just people not being aware and not, you know, they just get used to what they're looking at. They are not thinking before they click. Um, they'll receive an email, they'll have a lot of emails and they'll just be going through seeing what everything has. And when you look at it, some of the common sense measures I've, um, that you can take is, you know, for example, I see commonly on the campus employees who just get up and walk away from their computer without locking the screen. Um, you should never walk away from your computer without locking it at all. That's a common mistake people may make. They'll leave it on at home, you know, when they're not using it because it's easier than just turning it on when, you know, when they come back to it. You can go to any place with public Wi-Fi, like Starbucks. Um, you know, joining the public Wi-Fi networks is especially dangerous. Anything you do when you're on the public Wi-Fi, when you're at Starbucks, you have to just basically assume that it's public knowledge. Everything you're transmitting, everything you're doing can be picked up and looked at. Inherently, those networks at McDonald's, Starbucks, have no security built into them, and it's very easy to sit across the table, you know, at the table near you and pick up everything you're doing. Um, so other things I see people doing is like not using antivirus on their computers, out of date antivirus, or especially free antivirus. A lot of people do that at home, which is inherently dangerous because what you have to understand is there's a reason why it's free. They're not giving it away. What they do is all of the companies open it up for, for what's called adware. So they're allowing companies to monitor your internet usage to look at what you're doing. If you start noticing your pop ups start mirroring your internet habits, you start getting ads, that's adware within the free antivirus a lot of times. And the thing that's um, scary about that is the companies not only do it, but then they advertise what ports they open on your computer. And so hackers have those list of ports and they just scan looking for them. And you can always tell who has free antivirus because it mirrors that. Um, other things, like I said, simply clicking on links, downloading an app because it just seems like it could be neat or going to, you know, free software, it looks like a great deal, so let's download it. Do you know the site? Are you familiar with that site? Have you checked it? Have you verified it, looked at it to make sure it's a reputable site? Um, when you receive an email, taking a second and looking, do you actually know the person? Do you know who sent it to you? Um, you know, before you click on a link, you can hover over it, and if you look at the bottom of the screen on a Windows computer, usually you'll be able to see where it's going to be taking you. Do you want to go where it's actually taking you? Is it taking you where it's where you think it is? Um, you know, that's the thing is thinking about the usage and being aware. Just like anything else, the more aware you are, the, the safer you are, because there's always somebody out there trying to get a hold of your information. I, I got to ask you a question that I, you just mentioned something that I was not aware of. Locking your computer, if you're going to get up and, you know, go away for a couple hours or leave it on overnight, um, how do you do that? How do you lock your computer to prevent attacks? Um, well, like on a Windows computer, um, if you're at work, on the, on the bottom left side you have a key that looks like the Windows logo. If you hit that with the L key, it'll lock your screen that'll do that. But like if you're at home and you're walking away, the best way to prevent an attack is to turn it off. Um, because if it's off, it can't be attacked. You know, for example, and people don't think about that too, with devices and things like that. I was at a conference just a couple of weeks ago and they, sh they revealed a study that in 2014 it's estimated 40% of identity theft that occurred in the U.S occurred as a result of hackers entering personal networks through connected devices like smart TVs, baby monitors, toasters, ovens. We connect these things and we don't think about the security or lack of security on them in what we're doing. So that's, is it, 
Is that considered a backdoor way to get into all your personal information? Yes, because a plus, toaster. <laughs> yes, um, because you have maintenance lists. For example, Samsung brought, has a maintenance list of IPs that are used for by their their technical support people to remote in to work on your TV. Well, those are public, so then I can sit, you know, remotely, and I can scan that range of networks. And whenever anything answers, I know it's a Samsung TV. I know it doesn't have antivirus. I know it doesn't have the security um, of a normal computer. It's most it's online because it's talking, so if I, it's got an operating system in it. So if I can get in and establish a foothold, then I can scan the rest of your network, find your computers, and it's a foothold that allows me into the rest of your house. Can I install safety devices on my Samsung TV and my toaster to block those attacks? No. Um, the best thing to do is when you're not watching the TV to disconnect it from the internet, or like we do at our house, we have it plugged into a power cord and we turn the power off to it when we're not using it because that closes the door. But it's, that's, again, the awareness, the education, the training, and understanding and learning. That's pretty scary stuff. How, how effective are firewalls such as Norton and other internet antivirus, malware, and all those other software programs? Um, in May of 2014, the CIO of Semantic released a statement that said most um, antivirus won't be able to detect malware attacks today. At the best, the best, very best, um, product is going to catch about 50% of the malware in existence. So when we talk about malware, it's just evil software. There, it's a general term that covers all the different variants, viruses, trojans, and things like that. The important thing is when you're looking at antiviruses, you know, I call it personally, for myself, I look at the big three, Semantic, Kapersky, um, and McAfee, because they have more people writing signatures, which are basically when, when malware's identify, when they identify it, they write a signature that will look for that within the antivirus and release it. Semantic, even with personal products, releases four updates a day of signatures. So the most effective antivirus is going to have more signatures. Those three companies, you know, have a, at least a third more people writing signatures on a daily basis than any other company. So to me, protecting my own personal information, that's who I'm going to trust. So I take it. Um, Semantic, McAfee, and Kapersky. So I take it you never leave your computer on. If you're going to walk away for half hour, an hour, you're turning it off. I either turn it off or I put it to sleep or hibernate it where it's not accessing the internet. Oh. So putting it to sleep will stop that as well? Right. Okay. I was not aware well of that. I thought computer. you could still access that. Okay. Well, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit, Mark, about how hackers gain access to our emails, our email passwords, and then how they use that to send emails from me to my friends that can wreak havoc in their systems? Okay. Yes, I can. And I'll also say that you pay me to terrify you, so I've now done my job, so this is a good thing. <laughs> well, the most common way that bad guys obtain email information is through phishing attacks. Um, these may involve a hacker sending a login page. It looks like the user is logging into Gmail or Facebook. Um, they mimic pages. We had an attack here at the college um, a few, uh, right after I first started. And the students and the staff have a page. It's called SCF Connect. And they actually mirrored the page, created a website that looked exactly like it. But instead of .edu, it was .org. And if you clicked on it, it wouldn't accept your credentials. So then you hit password reset, it took you to a place where you could enter your credentials. Well, now I have your credentials, I'm in. And so they'll send you emails offering you free things. Um, but how do they get in? Common ways of obtaining the information. Um, installation of key loggers is a real common thing where you download something, you download software from a site that you don't know about. Um, you know, as an example, I saw this um, just a couple, probably about three weeks ago. I won't say who, um, but one of our employees who know, should have known better, we were talking about a, a new tool, and um, we decided Firefox was the best browser, so we said, well, let me try it. Google Firefox and just clicked on the first link. And he's over there, click, 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 clicking, and finally I'm like, okay, wait, there's only one click to download the software. What are you doing? And then all of a sudden he's like, all these programs are opening. Well, because he just saw Firefox, he just clicked on the first link. Again, what we said at the beginning, awareness, understanding, 
if he had taken time to look, he would have seen it wasn't Mozilla.com, it was a different site. And so he's following all the prompts and just clicking, and it took a while to clean that computer out. Um, but like, for example, with key loggers, um, every, one thing that you can do to keep, that what they're doing is looking at all your keystrokes, your passwords and things like that. In Windows, if you've ever clicked on the start screen, and uh, Macintoshes have um, a version two, there's a place, you know, there's a little search box. If you type OSK, it's an online screen keyboard. And when you click on that, it opens a little keyboard where you can actually click with the mouse to enter your password. A key logger can't pick that up. So now you've just protected your password. If you're doing online banking, you can enter your credit card with that. It's a free tool built into Windows. And again, it's, you just, if, you look, if you look at the Windows icon and you click on that, right, right above that menu in the Start menu, there's a little box. It looks like a, you just type Run, R-U-N, and that'll come up with the Run box. And in the Run box, you just type OSK and OK, and it'll bring up that keyboard. I'm writing that down. But it's a way to protect your credit cards and things like that because a keylogger can't pick that up because you're using a virtual keyboard instead of a physical keyboard. So it protects it. Um, another means that they do is, um, you know, Trojan Horse software that they download because, like, for example, what happened, we eventually got to Mozilla, but it was a free site. They were not looking at where you're going and downloading software. You know, it's, uh, there's human nature. I want to get what's free. I want to get what's easy. So they're offering free software. Well, maybe I can try that. And if it doesn't work, then I'll pay for it. Well, there's a reason why it's free. You always have to remember that, that there's nothing free in this world. And there's always a reason why they're offering it for free, because they're making money somehow or another. It's usually not to our benefit. So. There's a lot of terms that, uh, that you've said this evening, including malware. But in addition to malware, then there's viruses, Trojan horses that you mentioned, spyware, worms. Can you describe what each of those might be in okay. a bit more detail? Thank you. It's almost like going to a hospital with all the terms we have. <laughs> um, malware is basically software that's intended to do something bad. And then everything else is a form of malware. So when, when we talk about it within the industry, we're talking about malware as an umbrella term. So like, for example, a virus is something that replicates itself in computer memory. It's the result of, you know, it requires a user to take an action, for example, clicking on a link or something like that. So it spreads by people doing things. Um, worms are more of an evolved form of a virus. They don't, they will replicate and spread on, <coughs> on a much, <coughs> excuse me, on a much larger scale because they don't require somebody to do something. Once they're in, they can begin to regenerate and grow a lot faster than a virus. Um, it was always kind of hard for me when I was first learning these things because it seems to me like that would be more like a virus that just goes on its own. But the, the virus requires action, the worm doesn't. That's the difference. Um, Trojan Horse is a program that appears to be pretending to do something that it's not actually doing. For example, the illustration I used about the, the gentleman who was clicking. He thought he was clicking on links to download software. He was downloading Trojan Horses because he believed they were bringing him to what he wanted. But actually, they were bringing him to a, to a dark place, as we say. <laughs> so spyware consists of malicious programs, um, which can be installed on a computer. Their goal is um, they differ from other forms because they're not there to damage the computer. They're there to gain access to information, to steal your information, to figure out you know, your secrets, basically. Would that include tax information? Yes. So it's not just. Um, more harmless information. It's, it's vital personal statistics. Vital and personal numbers. statistics and information, yes. And those devices or programs that you talked about earlier would protect against all those different types of malware? Yes. And you want to use layers. For example, I know that antivirus is only going to catch 50%. Um, best case scenario, you have a couple of different programs. A lot of people are satisfied with just having one. But then Windows comes with a free firewall that you can turn on, making sure that's turned on, making sure that you're getting the updates for your antivirus. Um, you know, Mac, um, Macintosh computers have firewalls built in. So having the different layers of security built in is key. And again, you know, like for example, antivirus, it doesn't automatically scan. It, it's something you don't want to just be using in the background and trusting. You want to make sure every time you turn on your computer that you run a manual scan, that you're looking at it and making sure that the computer is being scanned to be catching those things. 
I hear you saying that you should have multiple levels of this antivirus software, correct? Correct. Um, which would you recommend? Again, I mean, you mentioned three. Those, uh, Symantec, and isn't Norton uh, one of the ones? Symantec is Norton. Norton, Norton that's owns, what I thought. It's owned by Symantec. Okay, but then when you buy, when you have a Windows computer at home, and you turn on the uh, protection device, is that adequate backup, or do you need something stronger? Well, like, um, for example, you have, if you had a paid program like Symantec, Windows has Windows Defender, which can be used in conjunction with the firewall, and that's built into it, so you can be scanning with Windows Defender and um, the Semantic or Norton or McAfee, whichever one you choose. But now you have two layers. Then you turn on the firewall, that's a third layer. So that's what, I talk, that's what we're talking about when we talk about layering the defenses. Uh, when a company as large as Target or a major financial institution loses client information to hackers, how should people deal with that? Um, the first thing is don't be surprised by it. You should be protecting yourself before you even go to the store. Um, the FBI has a number, they call it the magic number. And what that is is um, basically when they begin investigating a case, they have to get to a certain point before they notify the company. It's just the way the case work works. The magic number is the average number of days that they know about a data breach before they show up at your door to tell you you've been breached. In the US, um, the last time I looked at it was probably about a month ago, the magic number was 198 days. So usually by the time it hits the news, it's been around for so long, it's too late. Um, as of yesterday, I looked at it just before I came over here, as of yesterday, in the US alone, there was 270 data breaches um, exposing more than 102,372,000 records. Um, and then, so really, it's, it's taking measures to protect your information before you even go to the store. Um, credit card companies will issue low-limit credit cards. So instead of taking your regular credit card, have them issue a low-limit credit card that you use for your regular shopping. Opening a free checking account that you only transfer enough for the grocery trip that you're going on. So that if it does get breached, what do you have to risk? Just what you've transferred in for that one shopping trip. So, you know, taking pr protective measures before you before you shop is the best thing because the problem is everybody says, how do I react to the data breach? Well, you should have acted before you heard about it. Um, and I'll just use a couple of examples. Um, a lot of people, you know, they don't always, they're not required necessarily to notify the major news. They're required to notify so it doesn't always hit major news. Um, for example, a lot of people don't realize AT&T had a major data breach that was reported um, five days ago hasn't been in the news. White Lodging Services was reported three days ago, and if you wonder who that is, that's Hilton Garden Inns, Fairfield Inns, Suites, Starwood Hotels, and they had a hack that was discovered after it had been going for two years. So that's, that's the thing is, if you're aware of this, and these statistics shouldn't scare you, they should just make you aware that you take protective measures before you go in. It's just like we talked about in a hospital, you know, the doctors will wear the mask, they'll take measures so they don't get the infection. Well, that's what you do when you're shopping, you're aware. You call your credit card company, have a lower, but lower credit limit card, you know, have a separate checking account that you use if you're going to use a debit card. Just take the, the measures to protect your information, you know, from the get-go. Um, with my bank, I have a uh, email alert. And, I, and you can set this, and I say, any expenditure over $50 that hits my credit card, I want an email alert. Mm -hmm. Is that adequate protection? Or? That's, that's, a, that's a proactive measure, yes. But usually the expenses already happen before you get the alert. Right, but they can take that off. Right. And they can claw back the money. Right. So at least that's something. Um, companies tout encryption as a fail-safe to online commerce. Uh, is, that, is that true? And for example, is online banking safe? Um, t in 2012, Comscore, uh, there was a Comscore report that estimated close to 29% of all internet users worldwide were using online commerce. So it seems like it would, yes, it would be safe. There are problems inherent to our system. For example, in the US, we're the last country that allows us. When you hit submit with online banking, and a lot of banks now have two-factor authentication where they'll send you a text as soon as you hit submit with your password. 
Um, I recommend that highly because when you hit submit, you have what's, it's just like a house key to unlock, to unlock your, your um, door. Every other country requires that key to be sent separately from your password, so I'd have to intercept both in order to get your password. In the U.S., most banks transmit the two together in one packet, so if I receive one, I've got the other. Now, it's a matter of me being able to decrypt it, to discover it, but it's there. And that's why, again, looking at being proactive, taking the alerts like you were talking about, um, you know, thinking before you shop. There's some, you know, some common sense things. There's a lot of fake websites out there that actually transmit to the real store, the real th sites, um, you know, confirming that the bank that you're dealing with is legitimate. You can actually go on the FDIC site and pull and look up websites and confirm that they're actually legitimate. Um, being aware of copycat sites, you know, there's like we talked about earlier, they make sites that look like your bank and it's just slightly off. One letter might be off. Being aware, looking at it, and, you know, that's something I just, that's really the big thing is just awareness, so. Are organizations like LifeLock a good preventative measure to take? Yes and no. Um, they're reactive measures. You know, you've been breached, so this is how you react. Um, again, they can be part of what we talked about earlier with layering your defenses. Mm -hmm. um, they can be a part of that layering. Well, I'm a, a big online shopper. I don't have much time to do that in person, so I, most of what I buy, I buy online. And frequently they take you to what's a secure site if you're going to put in your credit card information. Is that secure? Is that a different level of security than the typical website? How does that work? You don't always want to um, assume it's secure. Um, awareness again. Um, you want to make sure that you're looking up top of this as HTTPS. Then you know it's supposedly secure. But you don't want to automatically say, drop your guard and say, well, it's automatically secure. Um, for example, we have some tools here at the college um, and we're, we're, we're looking at protecting um, student employees, social security numbers, so on and so forth. And we've noticed, one of the things our tools have noticed is that um, sites that are supposed to be encrypted sometimes will send it encrypted, sometimes won't. It's, so it should be encrypted, but it might not be completely encrypted. Or 80% of the transmission is encrypted, 20% is not. So again, being aware of what you're looking at, and that goes back to what I was talking about with having low limit credit cards, you know, using the same protective measures for online as you're using offline. Just being aware of the danger ahead of time and then taking the measures to protect yourself. This being the end of tax season, I have to ask about uh, the safety of uh, software uh, that allows you to fill out your income tax form and send it in. Uh, what do you consider the safety factor of those? Um, after a re recent report, and I can't give the exact date, but um, h and Black Block and TurboTax, um, both companies suffered severe breaches and both companies suppressed it and are receiving fines for suppressing it. But, it, uh, I mean, several hundred thousand or more users of the software's tax information was stolen. Um, That's very disturbing. <laughs> and again, you know, being aware, being, so that, that would be my, um, my concern with that, so. Would you recommend just going to irs.gov and filling out your taxes that way? Um, that would be if you're going to be doing it online, but it, I, I tend to tr go towards paranoid. I don't trust the government. Um, <laughs> Do you file a paper form? <laughs> we actually have. Um, we actually have been filing paper forms, but um, for example, there was an article online recently. Um, Brian Krebs looked, had this article. Um, and it was about the myirs.gov, and he actually traced somebody who had gone through identity theft. It's a really interesting article on Krebs on security. Um, but it was interesting because the way they got their information was at myirs.gov. There's an account that you can set up for yourself, 
And what they found was people were setting those accounts up without actually being that person. And there was very little authentication. So he's recommending everybody go there and make sure you get the account set up before somebody else does because whoever gets there first is who gets to set the account up. But it's a very interesting article and, and it's something I would, I'd recommend reading. Um, but again, it's, it's Brian Krebs on Krebs on Security. It's, there was, it's about, he had this blog report about the IRS and, and it actually traced the whole thing about the reaction, how the people got their identity back and their actions they took. So it was if you do that, if you do set up that account with the IRS, is that good for years and years? Or is it only good for one year? Um, I really don't know off the top of my head. But even if it is good for years and years, that's another problem people have is they'll set up an account and just leave it. But you should be going in and changing your password just like you do with your computer on online accounts. You should be regularly, you know, at least every 90 days changing the password and taking those proactive measures. If you, I'm not one who practices that. <laughs> it's a pain in the rear, frankly. But, um, you know, I, uh, my daughter does that and she puts those in a cloud, in the cloud. Is that safe? I mean, if you're going to change your passwords constantly, it's memory is that's the problem. Um, Remembering them. What I recommend, which is easier for the users, and in every survey with users um, says they prefer it, but every time you say it, everybody cringes and goes, <laughs> um, is having at least 15 characters in your password because you can change it less often if you have more characters. Not more characters. What you can use is a passphrase. For example, the phrase, my fluffy bunny, with a capital M, she is four years old, with the letter four, with the number four, exclamation point. The NSA took that password in over two years with the mainframe computer were unable to break it. Now, what's easier to remember, an eight-digit password with a bunch of exclamation parts and stars, mm -hmm. trying to remember that, or a phrase, um, for example, my wife and I met in the Bahamas. I can make up a password that says we met in the Bahamas so many years ago. That's easy for me to remember. Your cousin's middle name or your sec, you know, where you went on your honeymoon, things that nobody else would know. You make up a sentence. You could actually get away with changing it every six months mm. and just it'd be more secure than having a short password that you're changing every 30 days. I've had the, had the same password for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be changing that tomorrow. <laughs> and it, it's password, right? Uh, no. <laughs> but that is that is well used. <laughs> In hackers everywhere, thank you. Uh, well, thank God I haven't been hacked. Uh, let's uh, discuss the um, differences between browser security and network security. Uh, what should the general public know that will help them understand the differences? and the security that they need? Um, well, a simple way to think about network security would be in terms of the appliances. You have like in your kitchen, like a microwave, toaster, um, blender. When we talk about network security, we're think, talking about the things that connect them. So in the kitchen, what connects them? The power. So when we're talking about network security, that's what we're talking about. You know, it could include the, inc the electricity, the powers, the devices. Um, in the context of this discussion, a network vulnerability could be compared to the risk of being electrocuted. Um, it would include using a wire connection for internet versus a wireless connection. Um, to protect yourself, you know, we know inherently wireless is not secure. Um, if you're going to be doing online banking, if you can set up a wired connection, that's always going to be more secure than a wireless connection. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about um, now, you know, browser security, that's, it's an application. A browser, you know, is a computer application. It's just a program. In application level security, we're talking about program level security, the programs you run. You know, specific to the individual programming that's running on your computer, it focuses on, you know, what you place in the blender, the buttons you push on the blender. That's what you're talking about with application layer security. And it's what we've been talking a lot about all along. It's being aware educating yourself. There's a lot of good resources out there and just inherently accepting the fact that there are risks. And for example, you know, when I talk about the different layers of security, when we're talking about application network security, you know, it's like in approaching the security with the college. You, you can't look at it as we haven't been breached. We have to look at it as we're breached. We want to find the attacker and kick them out. Um, in the same way, 
you know you're going to be breached, you know you're going to have an identity theft, you know you're, that somebody's going to take your information. So the goal now becomes not just to protect it, but how do I make it more expensive for the hacker to get my information than Bill's? Because if it's harder for them to get mine, they're going to go to Bill's house. It's not really a great way to think, but that's... I think they're going to Chris's house. Well, Chris's he's house got has been changed for 25 years, so he's made it real easy. <laughs> but that's, that's the thing is, you want to make it harder for the hacker to hack you than someone else? Because they're not going to go to the effort because there's, they know there's a lot of other easier targets. So if they start getting into it and seeing you have these long passwords, they start seeing this is going to take some effort. There's millions of other people who aren't going to make it hard on them. Well, I don't have my toaster on my iPhone, so I think I'm pretty safe in that regard. But let's, let's do talk about uh, smartphones and the vulnerability there. You'd mentioned something prior to our discussion here, and I think the audience here would like to hear some of that because it does sound very vulnerable. Um, that's an area a lot of people don't think about. Smartphones are very insecure. Um, for example, the wireless on, we looked at it beforehand, he hasn't changed his password in 25 years. He maintains Bluetooth and wireless connections at all times. Um, he, I just turned them off. He's a hacker's best friend. <laughs> if you leave your wireless on on your phone, um, or an iPad or something like that, even if you're not connected to the wireless, when it's sitting in your pocket or your purse, I can access all the information off of it. Um, a good website to go to that really will open up your eyes is pleaserobme.com. Seriously? Seriously. <laughs> I'm writing that down. <laughs> what these people do, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but they mine social media and people take pictures with their smartphones and even if you have geolocation turned off the GPS coordinate where you take that picture is embedded on it. So they take pictures at home and then take pictures and say hey I'm on vacation and they post it on pleaserobme.com to let people know this person's on vacation this is the GPS coordinates of his house and but it's an awareness and that's the thing is every piece of information on your device is totally available because your device puts out a beacon every few seconds if the wireless is on because it's trying to find it. Sitting in your pocket, sitting in your purse, if the wireless or Bluetooth is turned on, I can access it without going through your password. And it just takes a second. Most of them are real easy to turn it off. Um, and if you're not accessing the network, you turn it off. Um, if you're at a public place like Starbucks, and you have a device that has, you know, cellular data plans, use the data plan because to using a data plan, I have to go through the cell tower, use wireless, I just have to go through your device, which is right there. It's real easy. So, well, uh, How common is it that, that people lose critical information by doing that, by making that mistake on a, on a cell phone or a smartphone? Um, one of the questions earlier was how do I obtain email addresses? Well, I can mine all of your email contacts off of your phone, and I've got a whole list of emails to spam. Sitting in Starbucks while you're, you know, surfing the internet on the Starbucks thing, I can pull all of your data off your iPad, off your phone, if you're using the wireless. How can you be secure in using something like that, a, a, you know, in Starbucks or wherever? Is there a way to prevent that? while you're in Starbucks? Not using, and, not using the public Wi-Fi. Uh, all public Wi-Fi then is, you're exposed. Correct. For example, if you have your Wi-Fi turned on and you're connected to a network um, and you text, your phone is automatically going to default to send the text over the wireless so it's not using your data plan. Um, if you're talking, your voice, is, your voice communication actually will go across the wireless. Um, it's very eye-opening to sit in a hotel with a, what we call the sniffer capturing traffic because you have all the text and voice conversations you can capture. So you're really not saving money by using those free wireless connections. You're exposing yourself. Correct. It's a risk. Are you willing to take the risk? Are you willing to accept the cost that comes with using the free? Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, wow. in terms of context, we were talking earlier about how many attacks that we have on our system at the college on a daily basis. Can you talk about that and then what that might translate into to an individual household or a personal computer? Um, most attacks today are, are automated. Um, automated scans of networks and so on and so forth. Um, we have 
over, if we look at it, we have over 40,000 scans um, on our network every single day. You look in a residential situation, um, one of our new tools actually looks at the scan and we looked at it a couple um, weeks ago and it's almost like a continuous thing on our home network of just people scanning and looking for holes. Um, I mean, in a given day at a house, you could have, I mean, literally a thousand or more scans looking for holes in your network. It's, um, and they especially when you look at it, like for, I was, uh, when you look at it, especially at night, it increases because most people, like, they're no longer watching TV, so they just turn it on and leave it connected. Um, and that's where turning off the power, things like that, like we've been talking about here at the college, okay, when people leave, at 10 o'clock, let's shut things down until about 5 a.m. when people start coming in because you have some people who come in early. But start shutting, forcing things to be shut off because if it's shut off, I can't access it. Well, isn't that a part of a problem too with uh, a, a business that you know they need to update software so they want you to leave your computer on or at least not totally shut it down? That's, that's one problem. But, and that's where, in a business situation, you want to set up a maintenance window where, and, and randomize that. Where, because if it, one problem, one thing you look at when we, like with penetration testing, is where you get paid to hack. And, um, and you look for patterns. Okay, so every Tuesday night, I'm going to do maintenance. So I start seeing, when I'm scanning the network, that things are on on Tuesday nights. I know that's your maintenance window. So rather than have it on one night, varying it, having it on different nights, because you don't want to be predictable. You want to make it harder, because if it's harder, they're going to be looking elsewhere. Like for example, and also it comes in from overseas. Um, we were discussing before the session, um, today we had scans from, um, we scans from over, over 17 different countries on this college's network. So we're an international campus. <laughs> so <laughs> it's Not in a good way. <laughs> it's, and we're keeping them out, so everybody's safe. I have one other question about Wi-Fi at home. Um, obviously, most people have that password protected. Does that make it safe, or if it's a weak password, does that expose you, or are you exposed anyway? A, a weak password um, will always expose you more than a stronger one. You want to have a long password. You want to change it often. Um, that's, that's, that's one problem with Wi-Fi is most people Set it and forget it. They never change it. Um, for example, you probably 25 years ago say you're wireless. Um, but again, longer. But I mean, and one thing with the wireless is it's it's kind of a hit and miss because accessing your network, I'd have to be within a mile of your house to access your network. Are there people who do that? Yeah. But is it easier to do it remotely to scan your network? I can get a lot more fish going that way. So how are you going to scan? And inherently, home wireless is not that difficult to break, even with the strongest encryptions. There are methods, which I won't say, um, to overcome it. But again, I have to be on the street sitting outside of your house, and, and most of your attacks today are going to come remotely. So you, it's not as much to worry about, but again, it's being aware, being safe, and understanding the risks. Uh, what are the there's been a lot of talk at Target and, and a lot of other companies have lost thousands of people's personal information to hackers in foreign countries. Um, how do you protect yourself from that kind of thing? Um, again, it's, it's being aware. What we've been talking about, taking the measures, being proactive instead of reactive. Too many times people wait until they hear that they've been hacked to start taking measures. Um, it's, okay, this is the reality we live in. We live in a connected world. I need to start changing my password often. I need to go to longer passwords. I need to pay for antivirus. Um, I can't tell you how many people still have free antivirus, and we've talked about that, I've beat on that. But being proactive, taking the measures beforehand, because as we've discussed earlier, by the time we hear about it, it's already happened probably months ago. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the disturbing part. So we talked a little bit about how hackers get into the computer, but so you've been hacked. Now, what do you do to recover? Um, 
something like LifeLock, like you talked about earlier, a program like that, um, calling your banks, you know, calling the credit card companies, having the cards canceled, changed. Um, there's even on a personal basis, you can buy identity theft insurance. How about sorting out your hardware? How do you go about putting your computer back in order? Um, you can clean it the very best, which most people say it's too inconvenient. The very best thing to do is to erase your, your operating system and rebuild it from scratch. Um, you have a lot of malware today that's what they call memory only, that's not even in the hardware itself. Um, I've actually seen um, malware that embeds itself in what's called the BIOS. It's a chip that runs the basic underlying system. And once it's in that, you can't get it out. Um, so it's like usually the best thing because probably about, you know, if you look at studies, probably 80% of the malware out there, you can clean it off the computer, but it's going to leave something behind. So if you just erase the operating system and have it rebuilt, that's usually the best bet. You erase the operating system and don't you lose all your data and everything else? That's why you should be backing up your data on a regular basis. Um, Has that been 25 years also, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> should be doing regular backups. One, one thing you can do is, um, is storage is not really that expensive when you look at it nowadays. Um, you can use an external hard drive. Um, they have them at Walmart. I mean, a terabyte drive would, even a 500 gigabyte drive you can buy for under $50. You connect it into the USB port, and anytime you're using any personal information, any information you don't want stolen, you connect it, you use it, you disconnect it, and you use the computer, you know, for everything else. So then anything that you don't want to be compromised is not on the computer itself. So then if you have to rebuild it or have to take it to a shop to have it re rebuilt, you're not losing anything. How can you be assured that when you're backing up something like that, you're not putting the malware into your backup? You, s you scan the computer before you do it, but there's, a, there's always that inherent risk. Well, I think it's time we uh, draw Bill into the conversation. <laughs> Uh, and we have him on the panel to talk about the college's new cybersecurity emphasis. Uh, but first, I'd like to direct a question to our moderator, Dr. Probsfeld. Why is it important for State College of Florida to offer this program? Well, like I said in the introduction to us, the, one of the most important missions we have as an institution is to be responsive to our community. And when it's brought to our attention that there's a need for um, graduates to fill a need for employers in our community, we want to be responsive to that. We also want to provide opportunities for our students to um, get into these new and emerging industries, and obviously cybersecurity is one that's very, very important. Uh, Bill, what can you tell us about the program itself? Sure. Um, well, based on um, meetings with our advisory board, we found that there was a need that they were looking for cybersecurity professionals. And um, it's an associate in science degree. We have a networking system technology program, and then there's two specializations in there. There's a network and system administration, and a new one that we're adding is cybersecurity and digital forensics. Um, it's basically 15 credits of general ed, which is, for most of our programs, that's about what all of them have. There's 30 credits that are common to both specializations, and then each specialization has 15 credits um, that are specific to that. Um, so on the website, if you go to look, some of the information is being updated because we just had it approved by the board, I believe, last a couple weeks ago. Um, so it was finally officially approved. Um, also recently, we just became members of CompTIA Academy, Microsoft IT Academy, and Cisco Academy, which gives us the ability to offer some additional resources to the students so they can get some of those professional certifications that employers often look to to validate their credentials. And will the classes be offered on the Bradenton, Lakewood Ranch, and Venice campuses? Yes. Um, depends on the course. What we try and do is kind of gauge where the students, I mean, I've had students, um, I, I've taught on all three campuses. I've had students in Bradenton traveling from as far as Clearwater um, and as far south as um, Fort Myers. So um, sometimes it's better to offer it in person, sometimes it's better to offer it online. Um, or we try and give it in both formats so that we can, you know, meet the needs of all the students that want to take it. So you will be doing online as well as traditional classrooms? 
Yes, this as program. much as possible. Sometimes the, a lot of these components, there is some um, desire to have some hands-on, um, you know, actually hacking into a computer and doing some of the things Mark's alluding, been alluding to um, physically with a, with a piece of hardware. Um, so that, that can be a little challenging. We do have simulators that allow the students, um, even if they're online, to do a lot of the components. Um, but yes, we'll be offering it in online, in person, and blended. So as we've heard from Mark, we're always trying to stay one step ahead of these cyber criminals. So within the context of this class, how are we going about trying to stay ahead of what's coming next? Um, well, that's always a challenge, um, you know, especially, I mean, it's a two-year program. If people go full-time, not everybody goes full-time. A lot of people are doing, you know, they're changing careers or they're going, you know, a couple classes a semester. Um, so we do have one of the courses in the program that we've added is current issues in cybersecurity. And that's going to allow us to address things that aren't specifically addressed in another course. Um, because a lot of times, uh, you know, as you know, Carol, we got, have to have our courses approved. Everything has to go through a process. Um, so that gives us a little more flexibility and being able to address those more current issues. Are there any admission requirements or prerequisites to the program? Um, nothing other than our general, I mean, it's, we have an open enrollment policy, um, so students, you know, uh, potential students don't necessarily have to take SAT and so forth. Um, uh, we'll have some students that are part of dual enrollment programs through high school um, that may choose to go down this path. Um, but um, basically, a love of technology and a, a willingness to work long hours when necessary. <laughs> so. um, no, no, I'm age range. Um, I mean, we have the collegiate school. Those, ki those guys are 14, 15 years old, potentially. So on up to, we've had people in their 60s and 70s in our classes. Um, not Obviously not these, because they're brand new, but. Is there a risk of training hackers? Absolutely. Nothing you can do there. I mean, we, we, can't, we can't do a, um, uh, a background check on everybody and uh, it would be nice but probably would uh, um, be co too cost efficient. So for those who are not choosing to go into the hacking business, what kind of jobs will these graduates um, be looking to fill and uh, what's the salary range of those jobs? Sure. Um, we have um, the bit demand for cybersecurity uh, is growing 12 times faster than non-IT jobs. Uh, and about three and a half times faster than the demand for other IT jobs in recent years. There's just a huge unfilled um, vacuum of, of need for cybersecurity. Um, some students will already be in the IT field, so they may be trying to get additional credentials to make, you know, to make progress within the organization they currently work for. Um, but we do have some things on our website, uh, Career Coach, where you can go um, look and see, based on a degree, what jobs are available and so forth. There's also another site called Employ, uh, Employ Florida, but I did a quick look. I was hoping to be able to pull it up here, but we're not able to. Um, currently listed in Northport, Sarasota, Bradenton, and Tampa St. Pete Clearwater Markets. Um, there's 123 network security positions, 289 information security positions, 68 security analysts, and 24 information security analyst positions. So that there's a huge unfilled need out there. Now, they go across the gamut. Um, the pay range is gonna be anywhere from $15 an hour, which is about 32000 a year, so not too shabby, on up to uh, $65 an hour, kind of what Mark's making. <laughs> I don't know about that. It, it, if I might say also, Carol, I was in a conference about two weeks ago over in Orlando, a national conference, and I um, met several um, cybersecurity professionals from this area. Um, that were working with me um, in some of the behind the scenes work. So I started asking them about, I was telling them about us developing the program here, was asking them about you know, the market here because we, we moved here last year um, to join the college. So I'm not as aware of um, the job market itself. And every one of them, there was eight different ones that I, eight different ones I believe that I spoke with, six, seven or eight. And every one of them said that the best opportunity in cybersecurity in this area comes from not looking at it as long-term career because if you because there's every company is so short-handed by the time you get experience, you can make a thousand, two thousand dollars more by going to another company, and that same company you just left three or four years later will give you a raise to come back. And they said they just all just kind of travel because there's so much opportunity here and so few people to fill that opportunity. So. That really, to Suppl me, validates what we're doing. Supply and demand, yes. Exactly, Bill. Can you 
talk a little bit about what kind of certifications might be embedded into this two-year program, if any, and then if internships are something that we'll be developing along with that? Sure. Actually, um, Mark is going to be having an internship under him, um, so that's one. Uh, we're looking at opportunities to uh, offer some internships with local employers. Um, certifications, there's Microsoft certifications, Cisco, um, CompTIA, which does things like Network Plus, Security Plus. Um, there's, it, I mean, it's a continually growing field, so we're always looking at how we need to address that. So when a student graduates from that program, could have a number of certifications as well? Oh, absolutely, yes. A lot of the courses that we um, teach, even even with our current pl plan before, uh, before we did the rework, um, are geared towards certain certification exams. So I teach five computer classes. Each one of them is tied to a, a certification exam now. Whether the students choose to take that or not is another issue. Um, but the, uh, we just, like I said earlier, we recently joined CompTIA Academy, which is going to allow the students to take the exams for half the price of what it was before. So an exam that was $300 is now 150 which, as all of us who have been students before know, dollars are important. So we want to try and be, be uh, aware of that and take it into account when we can. I, I wanted to drill down into something that I find fascinating, and that's the forensics. Um, you know, we hear all the time about the authorities grabbing a computer and digging deep into it and resurrecting files that were deleted, that, that you really cannot erase anything off your computer. Is that true? And, and um, what is the, describe the art of forensics on computers. Um, basically, uh, there's tools that you can use to go in, and yes, it's true, you can get things that have been erased. Basically, when a file gets erased, it's, the first character can get changed to another character, and that space is just marked as it's available for um, future use. Think of if you erase something on a piece of paper, you can kind of still see it, but you can write over it again. And if I, if I might add in also, um, in the forensics field, I've, I've had the training in that I'm certified as a forensic examiner. The one thing that's fascinating um, on a computer is that every keystroke you make, every mouse click you make, will, will create between three and seven entries within your registry. Um, it was fascinating, um, before we moved down here, I had some, an opportunity to work with the local sheriff's department. There are anti-forensic tools like CC cleaners, one of them, um, that erases things, but that too creates extra copies of everything that is eliminated. And so when I was working with the sheriff's department, they used to love it when people use anti-forensic tools because you created extra copies. So yes, resurrecting the log files, everything is within the registry, it's down there. Everything you do on a computer, Stays there. Stays there. Permanent. Yes. Until you erase the entire hard drive. Correct. Uh, you know, I think now is the time we'll start asking questions from the public. And we do have one question that was submitted via email. Uh, we answered three of her other ones, but she has a very specific one uh, about a MacBook Pro that she purchased in 2010 and an iPad Air purchased three years later in 2013, and they were all in sync with her Mac desktop computer. And six, since her desktop was compromised with malware, are all these products also in sync? Would they be automatically compromised with malware? Okay. Um, syncing devices doesn't mean that you're automatically gonna be cross-contamination, um, but it makes it more likely. Um, now, one thing to look at that is most of your infections, again, come as a result of a user's action. So sync devices usually have the same user, so the same actions on each device, which increases the likelihood. And hypothetically, if she was to purchase an iPhone and all four Mac products were in sync, would that automatically compri uh, compromise her iPhone? Not automatically, no. Again, automatically. It's, it's user actions. If she takes the same action on each device, yes. Um, if it's a worm, it could cross-contaminate because they don't require user action. But it's not automatically guaranteed that you're going to be cross-contaminating. Okay. How long does that take? Um, worm, I'm sorry? Um, like with a worm can operate, can, if they're connected at the same time, it could be instantaneously, it could be several days later, it could be a month later. Um, really dep depends on what type of malware you have in your device.
very much for hosting this. Really do appreciate all of the information received this evening. And um, if one doesn't have banking info on one's computer, et cetera, any vital information, um, what's the attraction for a hacker to be in there? Uh, what, and what would be the inconvenience other than, well, what would be the drawback other than inconvenience having a hacker in there? Again, that goes back to um, making it more expensive, more harder on the hacker. You've taken away all the vital information, everything that's valuable to them. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing is, are, can they get access to your email lists, which would give them access to other people's computers for phishing campaigns, so on and so forth. Right. Um, it's more of an annoyance at that point if you don't have anything to lose. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier about using the external drive mm -hmm. and storing all your personal information on that. It's just yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mark uh, or Mr. Baker. Um, very quickly, I recently my computer has been compromised, and when I'm trying to do something on there, um, I get these pop-ups, and I've taken photos of it because, as you mentioned earlier, um, they'll create something that looks legitimate, and I thought it was. I have a Mac, and so. Uh, it popped up with Safari, and as I'm looking at it, because they wanted me to call a certain 800 number, et cetera. So anyway, I'm looking at it, and I realize there's a space before the comma, and I knew Safari wouldn't put out anything like that. So um, these do pop up occasionally. I'll be working on something, and all of a sudden, a gal named Molly, pretty blonde with headsets on, and a message types across, says, hi, I notice you have Comcast or what have you. And she starts typing, or it starts typing a message. And of course, I just got rid of it. But they're very insistent. And I guess the only way to get rid of that is to Mac, I mean, excuse me, Apple told me I could bring the computer there and they would take, you know, take care of that without a cost, so. Yes, and, and the one problem with um, the Apple products, um, a lot of people think I'm more secure because I have an Apple product. Um, that's something you hear a lot. Mm -hmm. If you look at it, um, if you, you know, if you took it, there's a 10 year, there was a study done over 10 years. If you look at it, um, there's less Apples out there than there are Windows. There's, and if you took them and actually distributed them equally, the same number of Macs as Windows, then you would see over a 10 year period, the, the number of, the amount of malware was within 1%. Um, and we saw this recently, I mean, as an example here at the college, we saw this because that's been a mindset. And so we just, trans, we just transitioned to a new system, a new endpoint protection system, and a lot of the Macs had never had antivirus put on them. Um, and I, I saw an average of 27 different Trojans per Mac when we put it on there and started scanning them. Um, that is cleaned up now. Mm -hmm. But the problem with the Mac is it's, they're, they have what's called a closed operating system, so it's harder for the malware to get in, but it's also harder to get the malware off. So you wanna take it to the Apple store, you wanna take it to an Apple certified professional, not just somebody who says they work on Macs, mm -hmm. but somebody who's certified. And you can verify through Apple that you're talking to a certified technician to get that off, to get it clean. Thank you so very much, and thanks for addressing those questions. You really helped. Uh, next question. Gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity. There's a lot of discussion about big data. Would you uh, explain to the audience what is big data and what is collected in big data and how is it used? Big data is basically just uh, collections of large amounts of data that can be mined and used by businesses to um, provide services for the most part. And is, is there a security risk factor associated with the collection of big data? For example, Google is rather creepy. <laughs> and Google knows everything. And we always use Google Wallet and Google Mail and Google Search and Gmail and all of these great products for this trillion dollar company. What is Google collecting and what is that big data worth in terms of your personal security? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> they probably know everything the NSA is doing on top of that, so. <laughs> um, with Google, 
actually when penetration testing, when you do penetration testing, Google has a separate language and that's one of the things, actually your first step in penetration testing or hacking is reconnaissance and the best first place to start is with Google. Um, as an example, two years ago there was a Fortune 500 company, we're talking about big data that was breached. Um, the way they gained access, um, and the thing with, with the hackers, they've got time. And when we're talking about business with big data, um, data's money on the black market. Um, what they did with this company was, and they did come back to Google, what information is stored in Google. The CEO of the company's son was in an accident at school, the private school. The accident actually happened. The, his son was actually taken to the hospital in an ambulance. The hackers had mined data from Google. They had hacked the school's account. They had hacked the principal's email account and they were just waiting for an opportunity. When the son was injured, the CEO received an email from the principal's account saying how sorry he was about this and the school was gonna be there. We wanna help you through this situation. Gave the name of the hospital the ER doctor that was seeing the, the, the child, the ambulance number, and it wasn't from the principal. It was from hackers. But more than 90% of the information they got, the child's school, everything came from Google. So when you're talking about Google has everything, they really do. Um, and unfortunately, there's little you can do to protect yourself. Um, as, as a business, like with our website, there's a file called Robots Talk Text, and we can actually put things in there to that will block Google from scanning because they're robot they have what's called robots that search sites. They will actually search that first and they'll block certain things from being scanned by their by their Google, what they call Google bots. So and as a as a follow up, uh, if if one were to take an associate uh, of science degree in computer technology at State College of Florida, would that be a, a natural gateway, for example, for the the new big data program at New College? Um, there would probably be some, yes, because we, um, it depends. The AS degrees um, may or, there may be some, as far as getting into a four-year college, not all the AS credits necessarily go to a four-year college. So um, uh, we'd have to look at that individually. I like some of the programs that uh, State College of Florida has with Ringling, for example, which is an AS degree that would articulate it would be a special agreement that we would make with New College to put those pathways in place. We have another question up here. Thank you, gentlemen, for this opportunity and for taking the time tonight. It would seem, after this brief introduction, that the, the uh, the very term cybersecurity is an oxymoron. Uh, my, my question is concerning this uh, new to me thing of storing things in the cloud. Could one of you address or define the cloud and address um, the, the necessity or the non-necessity for using it and the, the safety or risk of using it? Um, well, the, the necessity is convenience. The cloud is driven by convenience. Um, for example, uh, Microsoft has the Office 365. You can get it on a personal or business subscription. Um, it stores it on, on a data site that's not at your location, on a computer that's not yours. Um, the insecurity of it is, um, like from a business standpoint, um, they're, they, have back, they store the data in the U.S but the backup data centers are located overseas, in Europe, um, India, and Asia. Um, like from a business standpoint, that opens you up to where's the data actually being stored? Are there treaties there? So if you're breached, you have to report it to those governments as well as your own. From a personal standpoint, it's being mixed with how many millions of people, what kind of security do they have within it to keep that data from being shared? It's convenient because you can access it from any device, but it's inconvenient in the fact that, again, talking about being proactive versus reactive, um, we've got a new data governments program here on campus with data loss prevention technologies. We discovered that every time you upload something to your, your 
cloud account. It makes a local copy on your computer. It caches a copy on your computer, and then you have it stored elsewhere where you can access it from any device. So now, instead of having one copy of it, you have three. So that's, that's a consideration you have to think about is you're multiplying access to your data by putting it in the cloud. It's convenient, it's nice, because I can access it from anywhere. I don't have to worry about storing it on site. It's less, less capable to have malware attacking it, but it's also more exposed. And it, that provides a backup as well. There are, you know, good uses for cloud computing. I think, you know, to Mark's earlier point, it's awareness and knowing what it is that you're getting yourself into from a business standpoint or a personal standpoint. And really, and really in looking at it from a convenience standpoint, what kind of data are you, do you want to store in the cloud? You know, is store things that are, are not essential, that are not going to, you know, personal information you wouldn't necessarily want to store in the cloud. But like pictures and things like that, maybe from a convenience standpoint, that's not as dangerous. Um, I mean, for example, I've seen that surprises me, like on our local drives here, on the college's drives where employees have stored their personal tax returns. That to me is just I'm scary. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're just exposing yourself all that much more. It's being aware, okay, it's convenient to use the cloud. I want to use the cloud. I want to use an account where I can store things in a central location, but what data do I want to store? What, what am I willing to risk by putting out there? You have the extra backup. You know, what's acceptable, what's not? Who maintains these cloud sites? Um, well, like with Office 365, you have Microsoft maintaining it. Um, it's usually the company, and you're just trusting them. Google Google has what's called the Google Drive. Um, iCloud with Apple. Um, Amazon has cloud storage. So it's all of the existing companies, pretty yes. much? Yes, yes. Okay. A second question, if you use, um, um, Oh, we read out of my mind. The computer things for preparing your tax return, but you don't, you use it for preparing your return, but you do not submit it through them, but instead print it out and mail it in. Is that a safer practice? That is a safer practice, yes, because you're not, you're not exposing it to the electronic transmission. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I have two questions, but one is, pertaining to banking and uh, credit cards. I've noticed that when you set up an account, they'll ask you one thing is uh, you're gonna use this computer all the time. And the second, then they'll set you up with questions, like who's your best friend back in high school and you know different questions like that. Uh, when you go to a different computer to access your account, uh, typically, they'll start asking you these questions. How secure is all that? Um, f the questions themselves depends on where you, you know the computer. If you're using a public computer, no, I'm using my personal computer. Um, it's it's pretty secure, but again, if you're on public Wi-Fi, anybody can capture what you're answering on those questions. Um, you know, if you're on if you're on a public Wi-Fi and, and that's the only way you can connect to the internet and you need to check it, again, what we talked about earlier with using like the on-screen keyboard to keep it from, you know, like a keylogger or something like that catching it, um, it is more secure to be answering the questions. But there's always those insecurities, being proactive and thinking ahead, you know, before you start doing that. So. And, and what are the questions that they're asking you? For example, if they ask for your mother's maiden name and you have your family tree up on genealogy.com or something like that, it's public information, right? If you put your, you know, if you use Facebook and you've got your, your wife's name and you're using her maiden name or something, you know, these in, if this information is somewhere else that the hackers can get to it, that can, get, that can make it more um, insecure. So one thing I've heard is just give an answer. It doesn't matter if they ask what your mother's maiden name is and you say, um, you know, coffee table. It doesn't validate that it's a valid last name. It just wants something in that field. So you can put anything you want in there. Um, for PIN numbers, phone numbers, use your home phone number from when you were a kid, something that's not going to be out there in the public uh, eye. Uh, thank you. Uh, my second one is you mentioned about turning on uh, Windows uh, oh, firewall. How do you do that? How do you know it's on? 
if you're what version well it depends I, I don't want to get too detailed but uh, if is if you're running the most recent version of Windows it's going to be on by default uh, unless you've gone in and turned it off if you're using another pro, um, one of the solutions like Mark was talking about Symantec a lot of times that will sometimes override the Windows firewall so you'll have a, a different protection that serves the same function okay thank you hi thank you um, it seems to me right now there's been sort of a uh, an explosion in people who've gotten their taxes hacked. Um, I'm not aware I ever was hacked otherwise, but somebody filed my tax returns before I did this year. How are they getting my social when I really am, has somebody else been hacked that has my information? If any of these large breaches that you hear about, if that data Target. is in there, yeah. it's out there. Yeah. Okay. I guess I kind of knew that. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, a couple of short little simple ones. As I was told that like a Samsung tablet or something, you buy one of those, you don't need antivirus because it can't be affected by a virus or malware. Is that true? It is not true. Um, like a Samsung tablet will have Android. And in the past, for 2014, they actually found more um, types of malware on Android devices than even Windows computers. Um, the, the problem with an Android versus an Apple, and I'm not saying one's better than the other, it just depends on usage and things like that, but from an awareness perspective, is Apple on average scans their app store and all the apps are scanned usually four or five times a day. Um, Android is an open operating system. They will never scan any, p any app that's put into the App Store when it's put in or once it's in. Um, and a lot of the apps in the App Store are filled with malware. And so you definitely need to have a paid antivirus program um, versus a free one if you're using an Android device, which a Samsung tablet is. So what is the big difference between a malware software versus an antivirus? Uh, well, the antivirus is designed to find the malware. The malware is there to do bad. The antivirus is there to inoculate, um, to keep keep the bad from happening. And the other one had to do with shopping online. Uh, one of the things I do is I use PayPal, mm -hmm. where I put a credit card to PayPal, and I just give them my PayPal. And I find even stores are starting to accept PayPal, which is interesting, not only online. Is that a better way to do things, so to speak, in buying than to use your credit card online? Um, the problem with PayPal is you have to get the money to PayPal somehow, and usually you do it with the credit card by transferring that, and that then you've created another copy of your credit card because they store it. So you're creating an extra exposure point. And plus, every time you do a transmission, they're transmitting your PayPal information and your credit card, so now there's two points of exposure. I know I use Bank of America and they have a feature where you can create another credit card number to use just for one transaction or just for one vendor so that's another option. Well, that's interesting. Uh, it depends on your banks. And the, the, the banks will usually call that a one-time transaction card okay. and you can set that up. Thank you. Oh, another one? Oh, sorry. Thank you. So many of us are using social media personally and I'm wondering if you can give us some examples of the risks and vulnerabilities that we're looking at and maybe some best practices, tips we can follow to counteract those risks. Um, with social media, being careful of oversharing, over um, that's probably one of the biggest things people do is they share too much information um, you know, it's my birthday. Well, now I know what your birthday is. You've just given me a piece of information which makes it that much easier for me to hack you. Um, friending anybody who asks um, is a common thing. Um, I have a nephew who had a real bad habit of that, and you'd see all kinds of people on their account um, making your account public. Um, you should have a cl you should make it private, and only people who you've accepted as friends who you know and have verified that you actually know them. Because um, that's another thing is if if I hack your account and then I try to fr friend you, how do you know that I'm actually her? You you know call the person and say, did you send me this friend 
request, just because you necessarily know the person and the picture on there looks like the person, doesn't mean it's the person. Um, call, verify, and make sure. You know, it's just again being aware. Another risk with social media is there's um, something called steganography, which you know, we're not going to test you on this. I know we're, that's, we're college. But it's basically hiding things within things. And so a common thing to do is Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, they don't scan the pictures on the ads. So a common tactic is to use steganography to hide malware inside the picture. So the ad pops up, you've just infected your computer. And, that says, and the antivirus is not going to scan that. So it's a risk. And one, one thing I would do personally because of that, myself, I would create a second account on my computer and that's what I would use for social media because if that account get, becomes affected, you just delete it. You know, before it gets, so you're not exposing too much information, so awareness. And how, how well do you really know those people from your 30th year reunion that you went to school with, you know, a long time ago? You knew them in high school, but what are they doing now? You don't know. I don't think I want to get on the internet anymore. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all for attending tonight. That's all the time we have. And thanks to our guests, uh, Bill and uh, Mark, great information, very fascinating. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Probstfeld. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for being a wonderful host, a wonderful partner, doing a wonderful job in the audience. Well done. And I have to say I am so proud that these two gentlemen work at the State College of Florida. As uh, insecure as I feel right now about cybersecurity, I'm glad they're on our team. I hope you all had the opportunity to learn a little bit tonight. Um, hopefully some things that you might be able to do that will be preventative in nature and uh, to protect your important information. But before we close, I'd like to invite you back. Tomorrow, we have our last musical performance of the year on this campus, and all eight of our musical ensembles will be playing outside in the Great Lawn, and the theme will be Viva Florida. So come back to the State College of Florida. We'd love to see you. Good night. Thank you.